Kadrin Chambri Shabla, so on the so all of you have been here since this morning, most of you. And so by now many of you must have been quite tired, but uh, continuing with your practices and this makes all of us very, very joyful. So I've been asked to say uh, something I didn't understand properly what I was supposed to say, but I've been asked to say something about the Milling Dorsen empowerment or preliminary to the empowerment or something like that. Mindroling, uh, because so many of you are now connected with the uh, Mindroling lineage, and also uh, personally, I think more than Today, I think 21 years, almost, or maybe one or two years more or less, I'm not very sure, but according to what I think, uh, Mindroling has had a very deep samaya and connection with Master Teaching Rubache. Now, over more than 21 years that I know, it may be a little bit more than that. And so since most of the people here today are either uh, disciples and students of Master Teaching Rinpoche, and many of you are then students of Mandroling lineage for many, many years, and have received enormous amount of teachings from um, Kojen Rinpoche, His Holiness Jabje Trajan Rinpoche when he was here, uh, and then of course from Jabje Kojen Rinpoche, uh, Jabje Kenjen Rinpoche, and then Yonden Rinpoche and Lama Chodrak, uh, Kimbo Jamyang and Sanjil Hondrop and many of the other uh, lamas uh, from Mindroling having been now settled in Taiwan for more than uh, two decades, most of them for more than 20 years. Uh, many of you, most of you are very deeply connected to the lineage of Mindroling. So perhaps we can begin by uh, speaking about Mindroling a little bit. I think also if you are uh, someone connected to Tibetan Buddhism, you cannot not be connected to Mindroli. Yeah. If, if anyone who knows a little bit about the history of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, such a person will be very familiar with their connection to Mindroli. Because uh, Mindroli uh, is not necessarily just a monastery or a lineage. Mindroling is a center of learning and practice. And since its center of learning and practice became very prominent, masters from many different lineages and schools always traveled to Mindroling to study and practice. And therefore, through the centuries, a very deep relation of almost all of the masters uh, of Tibetan Buddhism uh, have established that very deep connection with Mindroling. Of course, in particular, uh, it is very much a strong lineage within the Nyingma tradition. So the Nyingma tradition has what is known as the six main lineages. And within Nyingma, uh, these six, among these six, Mindroling is one of them. Mindroling, however, got its name Mindroling and then began to sort of um, become more prominent as a lineage after the establishment of Mindroling Monastery in Tibet around the 17th century. So actually the name Mindroling started roughly around 1676, 17th century. But the history of Mindroling is much more before than the time of the 17th century where the monastery was established. Mindroling's uh, history itself being very long, so I'm not going to go into that, but the lineage itself is called the Nyo lineage. One of the great prominent Dzogchen masters, Tsele Nato Rangrul, uh, who was renowned as the emanation of Terdun Ratnalingba, established uh, during that time his seat called the Darjichuling in Trachi, Tibet. Daji Chuling then later on became the seat 
of another great master and also known as an emanation of Zelenato Rangdro, Kedruk Donga Denzin. This great master had a son uh, who became renowned as the great master Sangda Chenle Rundrup. And then Sangda Chenle Rundrup's son, known as the emanation of Bharatsana, was the great, one of the greatest Tertans, treasure masters of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, emanation of Bharatsana Chujal Tedaglingba. Now, Tedaglingba, uh, this great master, and then his uh, brother, younger brother, Lochen Dharmashiri, both through the history of Tibetan Buddhism are called the moon, the sun and the moon of Vajrayana Buddhism. Now, these two brothers, the sun and the moon of Dharma uh, in Tibet, the Buddhism in Tibet, uh, were not only great masters, they were very learned, they were very accomplished, they uh, did tremendous amount of work in archiving all of the Kama and the Tema teachings and individually the Daklingwa particularly himself discovered innumerable great treasure teachings, Temas. But even at that time in the 17th century, these two great masters uh, were truly visionaries. So in their vision, one of the extraordinary, some of, of all the many different extraordinary activities of these two great masters, one of the very extraordinary visions that they had was the idea of non-sectarianism, remain movement. So those of you who are close and are especially followers of the Mindraling tradition must always know uh, what is the meaning of being a Mindraling. It's not just about being another lineage. Mindraling was born out of a vision of two great masters. And so you have to understand the vision, and that is what makes a Mindralingpa. Although Mindraling in itself is a Nyingma, a Dzogchen a lineage, nevertheless, all Mindralingpas follow the vision of Tetaklingpa and Lochen Dharmashiris of non sectarianism So therefore, Mindralingpas keep a vision of, of non sectarianism so therefore, through the centuries, since the Daglingbas time, Midralingbas have always had very close connections to all the schools of the Nyingmas, of course, but also with all the schools of the Kaju lineage, of the Sakyas and the Gilug lineage. So there has been tremendous exchange and very close communication and very close uh, relationship, Dharma relationship, right down to our root teacher, Chabji Menin Tijan Rambuche. So that is a vision that you must all understand and continue to maintain, that while you have your own practice lineage, nevertheless, the relationship that you have, the outlook that you have, is of being completely non sectarian Then, in their vision, uh, of, in the vision of Chujat Dadalingba and Lochen Damashri, they emphasized education very, very much especially in the Vajrayana and the secret Mantrayana traditions. Mindraling has through the centuries been always known as the main source of authentic and genuine pure Vajrayana practices, especially the Vajrayana rituals. So the quality of learning, quality of Vajrayana practice, quality of especially the secret mantrayana and the Dzogachembo teachings were very much emphasized that it be pure, it be genuine, it be in accordance to the authentic teachings and that everybody have a thorough disciplined training in them. So much so that after the 17th century, uh, it became renowned that any Rinpoche or Tuku or Kempo or monks or nuns, it became a matter of pride if they had studied at Mindroling. So if somebody went to Mindroling and studied in their biography, it was always nice for them to write, I studied Vajrayana rituals in Mindroling 
And that sort of became very renowned. We say doing something and doing something correctly are two different things. Mineral Lingvas have the responsibility of not only doing, but doing it correctly. So therefore, uh, I am myself very, very happy uh, to see that the tradition of doing it correctly is beginning with many of you here in the Taipei Mineral League Center. So when you wear the red Zen and you know the text and how to do the mudras correctly and to do the whole um, recitation so very nicely, and you've been taught so very well by Yudha Rinpoche and Amitra and the other teachers. So that's, I think, really keeping the tradition of Mindroling. So there's, then you can say it's not just one more Dhamma center, but it is truly living with the vision of what Tedak Lingba envisioned in the 17th century. Now, although Tedak Lingba and Vachan Dhammashri and subsequently all of the great masters of Mindroling and Mindroling Monastery itself being so very renowned in Tibet, could have been an, a very large institution. Yeah. So as you know, in Tibet, it's very, very common for monasteries to be very, very big with thousands of monks and thousands of nuns and thousands of people. But since its conception in the 17th century, Tevdag Lingba left very strong instructions that the number of monks in Mindroling should not exceed 333. I think in India we broke the rule and went up to 500. But uh, it's still less comparatively with other monasteries. The Daglingwa and Lochan Dharmashri and subsequently all the teachings always left instructions saying that if the head teacher, if the master did not know personally the names of every monk and knew their background, he could not give them the personal guidance and training. And therefore, in Mindroling, the number has always been specified to be less. We have a policy called quality over quantity. The quality of training has to be good. And therefore, Mindroling bars always tend to be very small in numbers. And that main reason is because of the emphasis that there must be thorough training. If there's thousands and thousands, it's harder to train everybody. But if the number is less, then the training can be more vigorous. So therefore, one of the visions of the Daklingma, which are very interesting, is uh, how much he emphasized quality of the training. Because he always, in his teachings, always say, Dharma practice is not show business. Dharma practice is about truly training an individual to develop the most wonderful enlightened qualities that we have. And therefore, those of us who are connected to Mindroling have to always remind ourselves, especially because it's very easy to get distracted into doing things, busy things and big things and so forth. That's much more easier. But training the mind, authentically knowing that I am a practitioner, I have to truly train my mind in accordance to the teachings of the Buddha. And that it is my precious life that has to evolve as the basis of liberation for myself and the other sentient beings. This you have to really realize your own connection to the path of the practice. And this then, that Dada Lingba emphasized very much throughout his life, and we as Mindral Lingbas try to keep that in our mind. Then one of the extraordinary visions of these two great masters also was the equal opportunity in education and in practice for women. So after Tadak Lingba and Lochen Dhammashri established Mindral Ling, it began in 1676, and then it started and it was fully established with these great visions and all the teachings and transmissions of the Kama and the Tema lineage were being given. But a few years after the Daglingba passed away, Mindroling was completely destroyed. The first Mindroling that was established was completely destroyed. So during the Dzungar Mongol invasion, uh, when Mindroling was destroyed, uh, at that time, Pema Jumit Jansok, was the first throne holder following the Daglingba. 
So from Tedak Lingba, subsequently the lineage holders always became the Dung, what is known as the, uh, in common language we say the sons of the family, but in the textual language we usually say the Bon lineage began. And so during that uh, invasion and the destruction of the first monastery of Medrolling, uh, Lochen Damashri, the great teacher, was killed, and so was also the first Trichen uh, after Chidadada Lingba, Pema Jume Jatso, in terms of number, the second Trichen. So at that time, the daughter of Tedak Lingba, Jitun Menjopadri, and the younger brother, Trichen Rinchen Namjil, were protected. Menjur Baldrin became one of the renowned women practitioners and women teachers. She escaped to Sikkim and today that the fact that the Dzogchen lineage and the Dzogchen teachings and Dharma has become so very prevalent in the, in the area of Sikkim is mainly due to her the teachings and transmissions. She stayed in Sikkim for some time, returned and then rebuilt Mandroling. So the current Mandroling that we have was the second Mandroling that was built by Jason Minjupadran and by her younger brother, Trinchen Rinchen Namjil. Trinchen Rinchen Namjil. Then subsequently then the rebuilding and then the continued vision of Mandroling continued right up till the ninth throne holder. So up to the ninth lineage holder of the throne of Medroling, it is considered to be the Bon lineage. In, during the time of the ninth throne holder, only daughters were born. And so subsequently, the throne holders then are known as the Blood lineage holders. Because the tenth throne holder was the son of the eldest daughter of the ninth Trichen. Jetun Chime Denden Drolma was one of the great women masters. Her son then became the tenth, my grandfather, a tenth Chichen, and then his, the tenth uh, uh, Chichen's son was the Chabje Minling Chichen Roboche, eleventh, that many of you have had the good fortune to receive blessings and teachings from. Many years ago, I think around 1978, um, I remember one time asking Tijen uh, my root teacher, my father, because uh, the Midrolling Monastery in India is usually called Nyingmapa Mahabuddha Vihara. It's not called Midrolling Monastery. It is called Nyingmapa Mahabuddha Vihara. Oh, yes. It is called Midrolling Monastery, but it is registered Nyingmapa Mahabuddha Vihara. And I remember there was some conversation between Kochen Rinpoche and uh, His Holiness about name of the monastery. Wow. So at that time, someone said the monastery should be called Mindroli and not Nyingmapa Mahabuddha. Wow. And I remember His Holiness, Trichen Rinpoche, laughing. And he said, those who think Mindroli is bricks and cement are making a big mistake. Wow. He said, if you have read and understood who Chujal Tedag Lingba and the founding visions of Mindroling are, you would know that Mindroling is not about buildings and temples. Mindroling is about the person, about the individual practitioner. Your heart and your mind, if it understands the Dharma and the purity of the precious teachings of the Dharma, Mindroling is there, not in buildings. There's a very fantastic monastery, but nobody practicing in there. Then there's no Dharma. But even if there is a tent, but those that are inside the tent are truly working with their mind and developing the view of the Dharma, that's where Dharma is alive. Now, so today also, the monastery is called Nimabha Mahabuddha Vihara. Sometimes people ask me, why? is the name, not Mindroling Monastery. Nowadays, we try to write Mindroling Monastery. But if you look at the actual registration name, it still is like that. And the history behind that is during that time, Chabja Rinpoche, His Holiness, this conversation, which is very important for you all to keep in mind because 
it gives you an insight into what the vision, what it means to be mineral lingbas. Mineral lingbas tend to be, and Rabuchi used to say, mineral lingbas have to be like the incense, which burns, and then the fragrance spreads throughout the room, but you can't really see the fragrance, but you can really feel the pre presence of the fragrance. Likewise, mineral lingba, if you see I am connected to mineral ling, it's very important to then understand how important it is to practice genuinely the Buddha Dharma. When you truly train your mind according to the teachings and you bring the purity of the practice lineage into your own mind stream, that is then truly being able to connect to this profound lineage called the Mindraling tradition. So those of you who are now practicing within this lineage, I hope will continue with the legacy. It's your responsibility. Now within this Mindraling lineage, based upon this great master, Trijatada Vimbas, Kama and the Tema traditions, teachings within the Kama and the Tema traditions, of the many innumerable main practices of Miling Dasar, there are several, there are many prominent ones are the Therma of Rigdin Tuktik discovered by Tedak Lingba, based upon the outer, inner, and the secret practices of Guru Rinpoche. Another Therma of Tedak Lingba is the Shinji Drechum, which is the Therma of Yamantaka. Then there is the Therma of Guru Drapu, the wrathful form of Guru Rinpoche. And the two main practices of Mindraling, the Tuji Chambu Deshe Kundu, which is the Therma of Cherezik, the Red Cherezik, and the Atikor, Torsem Atikor, or also known as the Ati Zabdan, or the Ati uh, Miling Torsem Therma, the Vajrasattva Therma. Discovered on December 19th, 1676, by Tadak Lingba from Okar Drak. This particular Dzogchen, Ati, the highest view is in the Dzogchen tradition being the Ati. And so the Ati teachings and the principal deity of the Ati Yoga being Vajrasattva, Tojisempa, this particular tema uh, which we are doing these next three days was discovered by Tadaglingba. It was the full moon day of the tiger month of the fire dragon year. And so tomorrow being the full moon day, I think it is very auspicious that we are doing the practice. Now, Doji Sempa, Vajra Sattva, name itself Vajra Sattva in Sanskrit, and then in Tibetan, Doji Sempa, literally means the indestructible absolute truth, or the indestructible nature as it is. That is then what Vajrasattva means. It is, of course, Vajrasattva is given the form of a Vajrayana deity, but beyond just the appearance and the form of the deity, Vajrasattva means the primordial pure nature as it is, which is indestructible. So I am practicing Vajrasattva is not so much deity as much as is trying to accomplish the realization of the indestructible nature, primordial Buddha nature as it is. Now, in order to realize this indestructible primordial nature as it is, name which we commonly then refer to as Vajrasattva. So whether you say to accomplish Vajrasattva or to accomplish the primordial nature as it is, the indestructible primordial nature as it is, a meditator from the Vajrayana teachings perspective relies upon the progressive path. In the Tantrayana or the Mandrayana Buddhism, the progressive path of accomplishment of the primordial nature is said to be dependent upon the three outer tantras and the three inner tantras. The Kriya Tantra, Kaya Tantra, Yoga Tantra are referred to as the three outer tantras. Progressing, progressing from the three outer tantras, one then progresses into the inner tantras, Mahayoga, Anu Yoga, and Ati Yoga. These three, Maha, Anu, and Ati, are known as the inner tantras, and based upon the progressive 
accomplishment of the outer tantras and the inner tantras, the summit, the peak, is known as the Ati. So today what one knows as Dzogchenbo or Dzogchen is basically speaking about the accomplishment of the view of the Ati teachings. Now to accomplish this Vajrasattva mind or to realize the indestructible nature as it is, relying on the outer and the inner tantras and progressively uh, being able to accomplish the highest, the Ati teachings, becomes important. And therefore, as Dzogchen practitioners, and to accomplish the Ati view, uh, the main practice is the Dojisempa practice. So the Yidang deity, or the principal deity for Dzogchenpa practices, is the Dojisempa, Vajrasattva. Now, commonly these days, people always speak about Dojisempa within the context of purification. That is one aspect. But the Milling Dorsem's Yidam uh, manifestation of Dojisempa is slightly different. So, as the Yidam uh, of the Ati Yoga or the Dzokra Chembo practices, uh, Dojisempa is in union with the consort. So, with the consort and without the consort. The difference between the two are these two aspects. The Dojisamba without the consort is more in the context of the Mondro practices of purification. Milling Dorsem's manifestation of Vajrasattva is in union with the consort because the whole concept of the union is about the non-dual nature of emptiness and wisdom. And this then is the absolute nature. So when we talk about realizing the primordial nature of mind, this primordial nature of mind is the non-dual nature of emptiness and wisdom. And therefore, since the mind's nature is non-duality of wisdom and emptiness, it is then given the form of Vajrasattva in union with the consort. So uh, I think maybe these days, uh, more of the people are more educated and learned, so they understand this. But there used to be a time when people didn't understand the symbolic meaning of Vajrayana deities, and then they would say, oh, that's a you know, uh, man-woman kind of a uh, union together, and people became a little bit confused. Non-duality has to be understood. 嗯，超越二元对立也是要被呃了解的。So um, if one is truly trying to realize the empty nature, uh, one cannot realize non-dual empty nature by having dualistic ideas. So nevertheless, here Vajrasattva, therefore, according to uh, the Milling Dorsem and the Tema of Chudyakdada Lingba, and then subsequently, almost all of the great teachers have always taught that Vajrasattva, the Milling Dorsam, particularly this form of Vajrasattva is the single deity that is the single essence of all the other deities. So therefore, because Vajrasattva is the principal Yidam deity of the Ati, the very highest of the view, therefore accomplishing Vajrasattva is known as accomplishing all other deities. So therefore, Vajrasattva is known as the single essence of all the deities, all the Yidam deities. In the same way, the hundred syllable mantras of Vajrasattva is said to contain within these hundred syllables all the syllables of every other mantra. So simply reciting the Vajrasattva mantra is said to be reciting all the mantras that are there. So deity, the single essence of Vajrasattva as a deity is the single essence of all the hundred deities, hundreds of deities. Just the six syllable mantra or the hundred syllable mantra is also said to be the single essence of all mantras that are there. And so uh, likewise, simply accomplishing the Milling Dorsem, the Vajrasattva practice, this particular dharma, is also said to be containing the essence of all the other Vajrayana practices. So therefore, the single deity Vajrasattva is the single essence of all hundreds of peaceful, wrathful deities. Uh, the mantra, hundred syllable, is also the single essence of all the hundreds of different mantras that are there. 
Practicing Vajrasattva is also said to be directly connecting with your own primordial nature. So therefore, it is seen as one of the most profound practices, a single practice that contains the essence of all the Vajrayana practices that are there. And so because of that, the Milling Dorsim, uh, through history, became very renowned. And therefore, this is one single practice that is practiced by almost all traditions. The Kajus practice Milling Dorsim, the Sakyas practice Milling Dorsim, Gelugs also, I think, practice Milling Dorsim, I'm not very sure, but definitely all the Nyingma traditions definitely practice the Milling Dorsim. So therefore, this profound therma that was transmitted by Vajrasattva himself to King Za, and then King Za subsequently then transmitting it to the uh, holders of the lineage, Karak Dorje, Bhimala Mehta, uh, Doje Hongze, and so forth, particularly Guru Rinpoche, and then Guru Rinpoche transmitting it to his heart sons. And Berotsana uh, mainly was entrusted this Mining Dorsim. And Birotana wrote it down and then concealed it as a teaching to be discovered later. And Guru Rinpoche prophesied that in the later ages, hundreds of years from uh, Guru Rinpoche's times, an emanation of Birotana himself would discover this therma and then propagate it. And in Pemakatang, Guru Rinpoche very specifically says, this is one particular therma that is going to be of tremendous benefit for practitioners in the degenerate times to have a single practice through which they can attain liberation and enlightenment in one lifetime. And so the emanation of uh, Birutsana himself, Chujyata Daklingba, the founder of Medroli, discovered it from the Okardrak caves. And we are all very, very fortunate that we have this very profound practice, the single essence of Tsopachembu practice with us. Now, I'm not sure whether you do it here in Taiwan, but um, sometimes as young people, many years ago when we were, I was much younger, in school, people used to ask different questions. You know, people ask questions like, if you were shipwrecked and were left with only one book, you were allowed to carry only one book, which book would you take with you? If you were shipwrecked and marooned on a deserted island with nothing except one book, which book would you take with you? The answer is Milling Dorsen. <laughs> if you are a practitioner, all you need is the Milling Dorsen. In the Therma of Mindling, uh, of Tadaglikba, he says, this is the only practice you need for complete enlightenment. So if you are shipwrecked, and in a deserted island, and you have only one practice to take with you, take the Dojisampa practice. So this then is the precious treasure. And so um, life as a human being with all of its qualities, what usually is said to be the 18 qualities of the eight freedoms and the 10 endowments, the 18 qualities that are very rare to come by. And all of you are very, very fortunate in that, that you are born with this precious human life. Not only do you have this precious human life, but you have met with the Dharma. Not only having met with the Dharma, but in your mind you have devotion and you have the sense of refuge. And these qualities are very rare. Rare uh, and an absolute gift, but still very fragile. So where we are faced with impermanence all the time, Although you have this wonderful gift of a precious human existence and you have the gift and the quality of Dharma and devotion, still one has to be very, very aware of the passage of time, of impermanence. So I was here four years ago. My question would be, what did you do the last four years? On the one hand, we can all say we were very busy. But then if you go into the details of busy with what exactly? and particularly busy with really attaining enlightenment or not, then we see four years may have passed or many more years may have passed. And yet, although doing something, we may actually have not really accomplished anything. And we can never be sure. 
whether we all have another four years or not. So reflecting on impermanence, really reflecting upon passage of time, and then from that being able to really understand the importance of turning the mind to the Dharma becomes essential. Where all of the wonderful qualities of the precious human birth, devotion, and your having met with the Dharma, all these wonderful qualities are something that you have at this moment. If you don't treasure it now, if you don't use it now, if you don't exert effort into bringing full fruition of these qualities, impermanence being there, one may not have more time to waste. So instead of mindlessly and with distraction, creating more and more karma and causes of confusion and continuous birth within the cyclic existence of samsara, we have to, every day of our life, really develop the awareness of how rare an opportunity we have to practice the Dharma. Not only practice the Dharma, but to have the wonderful means of such a wonderful practice like the Milling Dorsen. So therefore, whenever you have the opportunity to practice, whenever you have the opportunity to come together like this and practice, never missing that opportunity is important. Life passes and you know years and days pass and pass and pass. And so sometimes coming together like this looks like a program, but this is less about a program and more about using the opportunity of having a wonderful practice to truly working with your mind. And so each day that you practice, you must always have the motivation that may I truly realize Vajrasattva, may I truly realize the indestructible nature of my own primordial mind. And through this, may I bring complete fruition to this precious life where my life becomes the basis of liberation and happiness for myself and for all mother-like sentient beings. So you have such an opportunity, and I think it is only very, very uh, wonderful that you use this opportunity. The Milling Dorsen practice comes together with what is one of the most extensive teachings on the creation and the completion, the Kirim and the Tsukrim, and then subsequently the Tsopachembo teachings. So the actual commentary on the Milling Dorsen is one of the most beautiful and the most detailed explanation that is there. So with so many Mindroling uh, teachers being here, I hope uh, those of you who are practicing this particular therma will uh, develop the wish and the aspiration to receive the extensive teachings. This is very important. Only doing the practice, uh, not really knowing the meaning, uh, may not be the best of the ideas. You have to know the meaning of every word, every symbolic meaning. And it's a very beautiful and a very extensive, and especially since you are Vajrayana practitioners, it's very important to understand what the meaning of Vajrayana practice actually is. So I hope uh, and I pray that this is something that you will keep in mind and you will make it a point to request your teachers to give you the extensive explanation. This is very important. So then I think I will stop here for this evening. It's been a long day for many of you. I will continue tomorrow and tomorrow being a very auspicious day. It is the full moon day. And from the uh, perspective of one of the ways of calculating or calendars, it is also the celebration of Vesak uh, for many practitioners, although the Tibetan calendar varies a little bit, but it is also a wonderful opportunity. So besides the Milling Dorsen practice, we will have also the practice of Shakyamuni Buddha tomorrow morning. So I'll see you then in the morning.